Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm Marcus Engel. I'm your host, and this is a podcast where I teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. And today, my guest is Stephanie Johnson, RN, BSN, correct, Stephanie? That is correct. All right. And can you, I, I don't want to like give away all your secrets and you don't have to share if you want, but do you want to share what kind of nursing you do and where you do it? Um, I, yes, sure would. I am a nurse navigator at Ascension St. Thomas Midtown Hospital. Um, I actually am in one of the uh, towers. Uh, we're in the pre-op clinic. Very good. And Nashville, Tennessee, right? Correct. Excellent. One of my favorite cities. So I got to tell you this little story. About 10 years ago, I was speaking at a conference and afterwards I was having dinner with, uh, I don't know, probably half a dozen different nurses, a big nursing convention. And one of them said to me, well, one of the ways that we can help solve the problems that we're seeing in healthcare is through nurse navigators. We know mm -hmm. that they are uh, essential to providing care and that it brings up our HCAP scores and it improves our quality. And when I got your email and it said you're a nurse navigator, I thought you are the first nurse navigator I have met since hearing that story over 10 years ago. So I'm really excited to hear about your role and what you do and uh, how nurse navigators can help people like me at the other end of the stethoscope. So. Where, where would you like to start? Do you want to go back to uh, your, your first days of nursing or why you ever chose to be a nurse? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, let's see. I've been with Ascension about 16 years. As they like to say in college, I came to the game late, but it was a necessity that I be able to support my family. So I liked education. Teaching was an option, but nursing um, was the what I was called to do, I feel like. My mom was a nurse, so I saw her. I, I had doubts whether I'd be able to do it or not, but it didn't take long before I knew I was in the right spot. So uh, I actually came to what used to be Baptist, is now St. Thomas Midtown, for a um, just an overall, you know, they were searching for people to work, and they had this big... Um, big attendance and I came and I knew immediately I was in the right spot. I, I loved working here, great people. I started out as a nurse care uh, partner because I was still in nursing school. Got out of school, got my degree, started working on the floor um, and I haven't looked back. It's just been wonderful. And so how many years have you been a nurse now? It's working on 16. 16. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you've been in the same facility the whole time. I have. Yes. Love the loyalty. Everybody take an example from Stephanie. I love the loyalty. Well, Ascension's great because they have a lot of opportunity. If, if you need a change of pace, and sometimes you do, they have a lot of options. We even, you know, they even allow transfers from here to Florida, Texas, wherever we have sister facilities. If it's something that's a you know, good fit, then they are able to help facilitate with that. So. And, you know, I always share that in the profession of nursing, if you don't like one job, you can do another job and still be a nurse in the field. And that is almost unlimited. There are Lots so many different options. ways mm -hmm. of being able to be a nurse from academia to bedside nursing, as you said, to OR, to uh, case management. There's just so many different ways that, that nursing, uh, that nurses and nurses help keep us all propped up on this healthcare infrastructure that we know. Right. So, so have you, you work in spines too. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I actually was working on the floor with post-op patients um, when Ascension decided to start this program in 2019. And there were several of us that interviewed. I met with several of the surgeons and I remember telling one, I really want this job. And I have loved it. My uh, manager at the time, Michelle, she said you would be perfect in that role. So 2019, I came to this position, got everything going. Um, we have steadily grown. We now have adolescents that we do, um, some procedures as well. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a role that has a lot of options, as you've already said, even in nursing, but even within this role. 
there is a lot that I do, um, a lot of people I see, a lot of people I take care of. It's not just patients, it's staff as well. So, so what, what does a nurse navigator do? And where would a typical patient like me, where would we run across somebody who is doing nurse navigation? If you are coming in for spine surgery, you come to the pre-op clinic, you are having um, an evaluation, that's where we meet. Uh, that's where I introduce myself, I start the education process, talking about things uh, with the surgery. Sometimes, you know, patients want to know how long am I going to be in the OR? How long am I going to be in the hospital? What all is involved? Will I need help after? Um, and these are all things that a navigator addresses. We look at the big picture, not just two days before surgery, but while you're in the hospital, when you get home, we're as concerned about that. Um, we usually do post-op phone calls just to check in to see how you're doing. Um, and a lot depends on the patient. Some, some folks have had some surgery in the past, and so they really don't need much. Um, others are very anxious, almost distraught, so they need a lot of hand-holding. We do a lot of conversations on the phone, um, that sort of thing. But we're just, we're inclusive. It, it, it's the big thing is to know who your patient is and what they actually need so that you can address that. And that's active listening at its best, right? Listening to the stories of the patients, their experiences, so we know how to better care for that patient. That's that's active listening. That's narrative work right there. So thank you for, for doing that. You're welcome. We I, Most of us, we really love the job. It's just, you know, what we enjoy and what we do well with. So, but yeah, it's yeah. a lot of listening, a lot of asking questions. You know, they'll open a door and you'll go up. Oh, I need to look further into that. So, yeah. One of the questions that I was wondering about is the, the spine surgeries that are, that are happening. Um, is there a breakdown of what percentage of those are from injury versus, say, congenital or uh, age deteriorated spinal issues? Uh, there's a lot of different factors. Specific numbers, no, I don't. I can't quote, but I will tell you a lot of the scoliosis cases um, are from birth, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, we've had car wrecks. We have folks who have the DDD, the degenerative disc disease, which our surgeons take care of. And there's the two um, two lanes. There's the neurosurgery and then there's the orthosurgery. So we do both, we see both those sets of patients in the clinic. Beautiful. And I have to imagine that coming to a clinic especially facing surgery, that's a pretty vulnerable time for patients like me. What kind of things do you do to help make patients more comfortable when they are filled with anxiety and concern and fear? Well, by the time you're sitting with me, it's gotten to the point that you can no longer function or you are tired of taking the pain medications or you just want a better quality of life. So we are doing a lot of education because the more you know on the front end, the better you do. So trying to prepare you what to expect. Um, we're talking about situations at home that may make it harder on you. Like, are you in charge of raising children or grandchildren or great grandchildren? And do you have pets? How's your home set up? Someone who has just had a big back surgery is not going to be able to climb a flight of stairs to a second story apartment. So things like that. Um, people ask, are you going to come and see me in the hospital? Yes, I'll, I'll come see you in the mm -hmm. hospital. Um, what if I have a question? Absolutely. We give them our name, our numbers, call us. If you don't hear from us, um, or if we don't hear from you, we're absolutely going to call folks the day before surgery just to check in. But a lot of times we'll get calls between their pre-op visit and their call just because they do have questions. So um, we try to be whatever the patient needs. If they don't need a lot, then we're not you know, going to supply it. But if there are folks who are just anxious and just really dreading the surgery. We, we try to, you know, do whatever is necessary to make them more comfortable, to help them feel like they are ready. And if it means calling the surgeon's office to have the surgeon call them because they still are not sure they want to go through with it, that's what we do. I love that. And, and you know, I'm thinking about this, that 
I love the alliteration of your title. Nurse navigator just seems to roll off the tongue. But what you're talking about is is not just navigation, it's advocacy for oh, yes. the patients. Mm-hmm. It's it's stepping in to help make something happen when a patient needs that something to happen. And uh, I, I, like I said, I love the term. I love, I love the way it rolls off the tongue, but there's more to it than, than simply giving information. It's actually connecting the dots to make things happen. Absolutely. We are part of a big team here at Ascension. We have, we're in touch with the OR and that staff. We're in touch with all the surgeons offices. Um, we talk to nutrition. If we feel like a patient is not going to do well nutritionally after surgery, we're connecting them with dietary and dietitians. Pharmacy, we involve them because there are times when patients are absolutely their main focus is pain control after surgery. So mm-hmm. we have to bring pharmacy on board. So we're in touch with the whole team. Wow. And, and that, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, especially when we're talking about a significant spinal surgery, right? That's a it lot is. of people to coordinate. So yes. and I have we, to admit. Go ahead. We, we even reach out to the facilities if they're going to a skilled nursing facility or to an inpatient rehab. We're in touch with them um, trying to, you know, make that transition as smooth as possible and make sure that the con- care that they need is being continued. That's that's big. The care is being continued. That's that's good to remember. It's good to remember. And I always, I always share a, a little uh, narrative, I suppose, from each of the guests, or I ask my guests to share their narrative about a time that someone has cared from them. And this is the same story that I, um, that I always ask my, my pre-meds for at the beginning of the semester, is to reflect on a time that someone was there for you or that you were there for another person. You actually gave me two stories via written form, and I was wondering if you'd care to share these because I thought they were really powerful uh, tales of, of how people have been present and have received presence. Yes, the first one I told you about was in college, um, sophomore year. I situation was a little precarious. I was in the middle of a nasty divorce, two children at home, and it was time to pick our courses for the next semester, which would have been my sophomore year. I, you know, when you're waiting that late, you don't have a lot of selection. And so the one class that would work with what was going on was an honors course. And when I looked at it, it was full. It was already closed, but I showed up anyway and sat in that class. And when the instructor, the professor called the roll, um, of course, my name wasn't on it. And she asked us to raise our hand if she didn't call her name. So two of us raised our hands. She let us sit through the class. She penciled our name in. After class, she asked to speak with us. So I told her what was going on just I was just floored I was just I knew she wasn't gonna let me stay but she was great I knew from the moment I started the class she was engaging she was concerned she cared just by the way she talked to the students so after I explained the situation she told me she says you can stay in the course she says um but this is an honors course so I'm going to enroll you in that honors course and uh, that course work and it was wonderful first of all she made you know took a big weight off my shoulders she made everything work because that was the last class that I had to have and then she put me in the honors program which coming from the background I was I did not feel like I would be able to do but um, she opened that door and I I think I've told you in my uh, written part I never looked back that that just set everything in motion when the door opens, proceed, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. What a what a what a great story. And and speaking as a as a faculty member, if a student shows up that's not enrolled in class, I want to go hug that student. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be here. You're not even enrolled in the class. But uh, anybody who comes that is hungry, let them let them feast, right? Well, I, I was that. desperate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and apparently the but the, uh, desperate and determined, oh, yes. determined, and I was. that's those two things can work together to favor you. Yeah, and, then, and you you shared another story too about um, 
about a recent trauma that you witnessed. Yes, on the way home, um, I saw was uh, traffic, of course, was crawling, and so I thought, eh, it's the typical stuff, but as I got up closer, I saw it was an actual wreck, um, and there was a big red SUV with a little boy standing out, propped up next to it, and the, the officer was already there, and he was started all his paperwork, and I looked at that little boy's face, and it was heart-wrenching. He was just... He was bleeding. You could see he had been bleeding from his shirt. Um, but he looked horrible. And the man that he was with was busy trying to take care of, you know, what the police wanted and paperwork and all of that. I am not an emergency room nurse. I'm not an ED nurse. I don't pretend to be. All I knew is that that little boy needed somebody to stand there with him. So I pulled over. I got out of my car, introduced myself to the officer, just stood there with that little boy, got down on my knee, and I talked to him and asked him his name and told him who I was. And He may never remember it, but I stood there with him until the ambulance showed up because I just thought if that was one of mine, I would want somebody standing with them. And you said he, that he looked horrible. Um, you're talking physically, facially? Oh, facially. He just, was terrified. Yeah. And I don't really know much about the accident, but I knew he was bloody. And he was, you could just tell, he was scared to mm-hmm. death. I mean, just terrified. Um, and I'm sure if there had been somebody else in the vehicles, they you know would have spent time with him. But like I said, the gentleman that he was with, he was trying to take care of the officer's requests with paperwork and all. So, um, and and I had even asked the officer, "Do you want me to take this little boy out, out of the scene? Because we're in the middle of the road. There's five lanes. We're in the turn lane. That's where the car finally ended up. Um, and so we've got traffic on both sides. And I said to the officer, "Do you want me to take him away from this over to the grass?" And he said, "No. The ambulance is on the way." <sighs> It's just, it, it tears your heart out to see little kids scared to death, right? It does. And, mm-hmm. and there's so many people, um, maybe even healthcare professionals included, that would see that situation on the side of the road and say, I'm going to drive on by. They've got it under control. I'm sure EMS is going to be here in a few minutes. But, but you actually stopped and used your presence to help distract that little boy and help him feel cared for in that moment in time that's that's true presence right i mean that's mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to get across in in this podcast i um it's not just witnessing it and wanting to do something about it it's actually doing some type of action step to provide that comforting presence during a difficult moment and that's I think that's what we are geared to do as human beings. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe not all the time. <laughs> I'm sure that, I'm yeah. sure that we uh, can all think of instances, but I think we're at our best as human beings when we are, when we're helping. You know, just I'm here in Orlando, Florida, and we just had the uh, hurricane not really hit here in central Florida, but up more towards the panhandle. And there were uh, some young EMS students that were going around volunteering in low areas of Orlando. And they interviewed a young man on the, on the news. And he said, he said, you know, a lot of people have really great skills. Uh, whether you're a great basketball player, keep in mind, this guy's probably 18, 19 years old. He's like, great basketball player. You're really good at, at track and field. You're really good at baseball. He said, my superpower is helping people, is taking care of people. And I thought that is a beautiful thing that we need more of in this world where, uh, and maybe even I'm speaking as my my own gender here, that males need a little bit less uh, focus on how great your athletic prowess is and maybe on what your heart can do more than what your body can do. Mm-hmm. That's I, nice. Yeah, I just I just love to hear those stories of, of helping, and that's what you are doing every day too. Yeah, I, you, you just do it. You don't think about it so much, but it's yeah, it's part it's of just, you. It's it's part of you, right? Mm-hmm. It's not what you do; it's part of you. And yes. I'm I'm so glad that that your patients have 
uh, your skill and knowledge to be able to get through these difficult situations because the spinal surgery is a pretty scary thing. I've never had one. I don't ever want to be facing a spinal surgery, but uh, knowing that there's somebody there that can guide uh, a frightened, vulnerable patient through that is, that's a, that's a true gift. That's a true gift. Yep, it's a calling. Yeah. So in the time we got left, can I shoot a couple of rando questions by you? Sure. Sure. Okay. So you've probably heard me ask a question about, um, you know, if you could live the life of any fictional character for one day, do you have a fictional character that you especially love? Oh, I can't think of one. Um, no, there, I don't know of anyone that, that comes to mind. No movie character or character in a book that would be fun to live their life for one day? No, I kind of like my life. I can't think of anyone I'd want to, even for a day, to trade even off. for a day. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Uh, well. You like your life. It, I do. And it's always that, that thing about if you, everybody got together and pitched all of their troubles into the middle of the circle and then went in to get what you, you would pull yours back out because they're what you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So I can't, yeah. I think it'd be fun to do a life for maybe even not a full day because I would, I'd miss out on my own life. Mm -hmm. I'd miss out on my own life that I get to live, uh, and that nobody else gets to live. So right. I understand that. I understand that. Is there, um, is there any kind of art that appeals to you? Mm. The question of the proverbial desert island that you get to, oh, yes. to keep a piece of art. Or is there a, it would be a specific book. Thing? It would mm -hmm. be the book Men of War. I read it as an eighth grader. And it's not because of the story, but it's because of where that led me. That book, it was the first, I call it, serious book I had ever read. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put it down. I read it on the bus. It opened the door for my love of books. Mm. So that would be the book that I would have. Man of War. And I, I'm not familiar with it. This is about the horse? It's about the race horse, yes. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and I, they handicapped him, and he still won. Yes. It, but, and, it's, again, it's not the story, but it's just how it made me feel. Love it. Love it. And any of those books that open up a love of reading, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. Do you have a favorite book besides Man of War? Or one that you would gift to uh, others saying you need to read this book? Right, yeah. I have just, uh, my daughter talked to me about anxiety because we were sharing some things back and forth. Um, Lucado, Max Lucado has just put out a book, Be Anxious for Nothing. That book I find very um, helpful. And that's what I was talking to her yesterday about. There's sometimes it, you know, again, anxious, anxiety just kind of overwhelms me. I'll open a couple of places in the book where I've highlighted, and it's like it just speaks peace. I, I mm. like that book. Mm. Okay. It's probably been 20 years or more since I read a Max Lucado book. <laughs> I'm going to, I like the title of this one. Mm hmm yeah, it's a good Let's one. Check that out. And I guess, Stephanie, for, for my last question, what you've probably heard times before, because I know that you first reached out to me because you were a fan of the of the podcast. So thank you yes. for giving me some feedback. And we hadn't You're met welcome. at a uh, at a conference or anything before. We have never. No. In fact, okay. it's funny because when I was talking to my coworker, I said, Every time, you know, one of your uh, stories comes up, I say, oh, there's my friend Marcus. She says, <laughs> she says, how do you know Marcus? I said, I don't. I've never met him, but I love what he says. I take all of that in. So you're my friend Marcus. Well, I appreciate that, and I can't wait to uh, shake your hand and actually meet a new friend next time I'm in Nashville. <laughs> yes. So, so then for the last question, uh, if you had the world's largest billboard on the world's tallest mountain, what message do you want to broadcast to humanity? I would What's broadcast, your know your audience to be able to engage each person. Mm. Because everybody's different. Everybody needs a little something different. Um, it's just a matter of knowing what that is and, and, you know, being able to meet the need. And that's what I think we're called to do as human beings. Meet mm -hmm. the needs of other human beings. Mm-hmm. 
and that's what you're doing. And I want to thank you for for helping me meet the need today of, of spreading this information around. I, I want to thank you, Stephanie, for, for being here. Is there any kind of uh, anything that you'd like to promote? Do you have any charity work or anything like that that you'd like to promote? I really don't. Um, I don't. I'm not involved in a lot of charities. Mm -hmm. I teach Sunday school for the little kiddos at church, that sort of thing. Um, so... That's great, though. That's great. It's starting with the, the least of these, right? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for being with me today. And listeners, thank you for being with us today on Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare. I'm Marcus Engel. I'm your host, and this is the podcast where we teach compassionate communication, pro provide perspective, and inspire resilience for any keynote speaking needs, compassion trainings, and hospitals or healthcare systems. Please visit marcusengel.com. And thank you all so much. We will see you next time on Compassion and Courage.